particular book, I actually had an idea when I was in college. It was just gnawing at my brain. And it's like, it's more all these different scenes of Mina, like that, that end scene that everybody, that, that freaks everybody out. Uh, that was one of the scenes that was in my mind. I mean, obviously, yes, it is more of a feminist horror. It's a female serial killer who targets men, but like, I didn't really approach it with that idea when I first started writing it. It was just like, oh, it'd be cool to have a female killer murder men. <laughs> a book about that. Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I'd just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I would love for you to tell a friend about the podcast. If there's someone in your life that just loves metal, loves extreme metal, loves thrash metal, loves deathcore, loves metal... Well, do me a favor and let them know that the Vox and Hops Metal Podcasts exists. You can tell them that there are over 350 episodes where I hang out with some of the world's best metal musicians, and that's the absolute truth, and we talk all about their lives and music while enjoying a craft beer. If you would encourage one of your friends to become a brand new Vox and Hops head, that would be something that I would truly appreciate. Now, today on the podcast, I am joined by the author, Stephanie E. Jensen. Get ready, everyone. This is Vox and Hops episode number 359. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I'm with Stephanie E. Jensen, uh, the author. Very, very, very cool to be with you. Uh, we've known each other for quite some time. I want yeah. to say, you might correct me, I think it's since 2015. Uh, I'll go there later, but I believe it was around then we were on tour and we met in the States at that point. You are mm -hmm. an author. You are the first official author that I've had on the podcast. Am I correct? Yay. I am not correct there. I'm taking it back. Oh. I'm sorry. I just had John <laughs> Goblicon on and he he has oh. like a, the guide to better living. And that was my joke. But as I said, what I just said, I had Adam to pedal in on who wrote uh, the beer book the brutal beer book for Decibel back in the day, and I had forgotten that. But as I said it, I remembered it, so I apologize to you, Adam. Stephanie, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It's nice to see you. Uh, we we haven't crossed paths, and, and you know this damn these damn times keeping us apart. Uh, you are coming up here in Montreal sometimes. We never seem to meet up. We did meet up um, at, at the... my show. Yes. 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 Brutal Montreal. Yes, it was fun. That was a great show. That was, that awesome. was so much fun. Uh, yeah. Shittiest question. Uh, the one that I like <laughs> to start things off with, the one that we all mostly start off with recently. Uh, how have you been coping with the glorious years, plural, of 2020, 2021, and hopefully not the rest of 2022? Uh, how have you been living these glorious days? 2020 was pretty rough. Um, obviously the pandemic and everything it you know affected me mentally i was especially anxiety wise like i was worried mm. about well not only my health but my family's health i was more worried about my family than anything so um 2020 was rough but uh 2021 was a little better um and because i was able to travel a little bit more do more things um and uh, I started really going to shows and going back out again the beginning of this year. So now, so far this year, husband has, has been great. Definitely better than the last two years. So it's so weird how going to shows, being in that atmosphere, is such a crucial part of our existence that exactly. that we took for granted before. We really did. I did at least. I know I did. It's like, yeah, I'll see them next time they come through town. <laughs> you know, three years later. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and then a, a, a global virus <laughs> prevents all bands from touring, and then you just wonder, like, will I ever go to a show again? Oh, it's 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 a special thing that we get to do to to connect with so many friends. Uh, you exactly. you know it as well as I do. My side of things, having been the touring artist, now doing this, uh, I met you back in 2015. As I mentioned, uh, you were doing interviews for something called the age of metal. Am I correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's it. And I remember having this, this young bubbly character jump up on our tour bus. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to describe it. <laughs> and, and 
you know, ask good questions and connected with us. And yeah. it was a memorable connection. So, so we've right. met many, many more times through there. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, it's interesting to have been so connected with everything and then have it just disappear, but it's coming back yeah. and that makes us there feel we better. Go. That's, that, that, to me, that's what matters. And talking to all my other friends in the industry, they all kind of predicted inevitably all of this will come back. It just kind of sucked that it was halted for a couple of years. And I'm especially concerned about all the festivals. Mm. Uh, it seems like they're, yeah, like MDF, I guess this is going to be the last year, some mm -hmm. other festivals. I mean, that all of that is up in the air because they lost so much money. Mm -hmm. And then especially like the bands that either broke up or went on hiatus, like that to me is the most heartbreaking part of this whole pandemic. So I'm hoping, I guess what I'm hoping is that like with this, you know, now that we're, it seems like we're getting past that, um, all this, like all these great new bands will come out, all these great new festivals and who knows, maybe some type of innovative, whatever, something to uh, appreciate the concert experience will come out. I don't know. <laughs> Hell yes, I like that. And uh, the ones that will stick around and have fought through it mm -hmm. are the stronger, you know, the ones that have that will to survive. And that's mm -hmm. not knocking anyone that had to step away throughout Absolutely. the pandemic because it's it's a very, very difficult decision to decide to no longer do something that you love All right, I for any reason that's important to them. Mm -hmm. Vox and Hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends, talking about their lives, music and craft beer. Uh, what are you sipping on on your side right there, Stephanie? I am sipping on Sheepy uh, mm -hmm. out of my, apparently it's the Scream Bloody Gore. I can't really see it. It's the it's a death glass. It's a Scream Bloody Gore's birthday today. So I figured oh. I would celebrate, get a death glass. But uh, Sheepy here, I'll hold the, uh, my camera's weird, it's down here. I'll hold the can up. This beer actually means a lot to me because I went to Montreal for the first time 2019 at the Quebec Death Fest and I was at Foofs and just like when I travel I have this thing like I have to try beer from that region I have to so of course you know I, I go to Foofs and you know I see all these beers on tap and I ask whoever is working the bar like what's the best like Quebec based um, brewery and or, 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 or the best like beer on tap from a Quebec based brewery and so he recommended and did uh, Archibald and they had Sheepy on, on tap and I was drinking this all weekend. So, <laughs> and I, since, I've, since I've been here, I've discovered all these great other um, microbreweries here in Montreal and in the, and, and in the province as well. So. I love it. I love, I love, we have a, such a vibrant craft beer scene yeah. here, which is one of the reasons why I started Vox and Hops. I was completely enamored and addicted to everything that's going on here having toured the world i wanted to share it with everyone so cheers to you for enjoying a local quebec beer i will yes. not be cheers. Sadly. Okay. I, I will be drinking a beer from ontario oh well, well hey beer is beer and it's microbrew and it's a oh, devastation on the nation nice Hell yes, this is uh, Folly Brewing and Vox and Hops' collab for Devastation on the Nation. It's nice. an Imperial Black Lager called After Dark. It's 7.666%, uh, obviously. Nice. Massive shout out to uh, Jamie Morris, uh, Tina, the rest of the Folly Brewing Company uh, for pulling this sucker off. Uh, funny story about this beer. Uh, they don't can their beers. They put their beers in bottles, typically. And to get the beer at the show, in Toronto, the promoter and the venue was like, we only take cans. And within three hours, Jamie Morris is like, I got a canning machine. So hustle, <laughs> love it. I'm going to crack this and I would love to hear about your very first beer. Wow. Um, I mean, I should I talk about my very first craft beer, my first beer in general? Because I don't honestly don't want to talk about my first beer it's all it's a slow build it's a slow <laughs> build was... i want to hear the first one and then we'll build up to the good ones oh, okay well i'm trying to remember i it had to have been some type of college party it was i probably miller light just something so offensive and awful i also remember um trying bud light had just come out with bud light lime oh yeah <laughs> and I drank that with a couple of my neighbors again back of like college stage so um back to yeah um 
and then a bunch of PBRs thrown in between there. Um, those years were those were not good beer years. Um. <laughs> they were effective beers. And uh, Andrew Garrity, the three-time Vox and Hobbs alumni, loves Miller, Miller Lite. So cheers to him and cheers to you and your first beer. <laughs> cheers to Miller Lite and, and Garrity. <laughs> It's like nice malty caramel, coffee-ish, little bit of chocolate bite, really smooth. Um, I'll enjoy it as it warms up a little bit. I took it out of the fridge probably 30 minutes ago. It's going to be really killer by the end of it. Massively cheers to Folly Brewing once again. Killer, killer. So let's dance into craft beer. At what point did you, did you start seeking out and hunting for the best local craft beers as you did that night at Fofone Electric? So it's a funny story. Um, I reconnected. Now this is, I can't remember my exact age. I had to have been like in my early 20s, maybe 22, 23. And I reconnected with one of my high school boyfriends on Facebook. And, um, you know, he just reached out. He was like, hey, let's get a beer, whatever. You know, let's just talk. Let's hang. And so I was like, okay, cool. Why not? So he suggested, uh, this is in Largo, Florida, uh, Willard's Tap House. And he's like, okay, yeah, they have really good beers here, whatever. I'm like, cool. Walk in again, you know, Miss Bud Light, Miller Light, um, PBR, not knowing what, what even an IPA was at that time. So my ex had to just pretty much explain everything about craft beer in the span <laughs> of like a couple minutes because at that point I was, I was ready to drink. So um, I don't even remember the beer I got. Um, I think I had like maybe a cider, something like kind of easier, a pale ale or a pilsner, something kind of easy, I remember. A transition, um, transition yeah. beer from the PBRs and the Miller Lights. Yeah, it's, yeah, some some type of beer like that. And so, but whatever I had, I loved it. And I remember also trying my first IPA that night and enjoying that. Obviously the hops, it's a little bitter when you're a little too bitter when you first drink it, but I still remember liking the taste and liking the beer. And um, I do want to give a shout out to Willard's Tap House. They have 40 beers on tap at all times from all different microbrews all over the world. They even get like imports from like Belgium, Germany, uh, Czech Republic, all of that. And they're one of my favorite places in the world. And so, um, and now I go there on a regular basis. Like I introduced my brother to Willard's, uh, a bunch of my friends. So now that kind of became for a long, a long time, that kind of became our little hangout spot so awesome awesome place well well next time i'm down there in florida with you you got to bring me to willard's tap house oh i will you will love it there it's such a cool <laughs> atmosphere such a cool vibe and great beers that makes me i'm excited to get down there uh how similar was that to your transition to metal oh um, you're, you're like initially oh it's a little bit bitter but i love it was it the same thing with metal like metal this is too extreme for me and then all of a sudden you're just yeah. celebrating Scream Bloody Gore on its anniversary because you know that. Um, yes, it was definitely a bitter at first and now I'm drinking sheepy talking to Matt McGatchy on, on, on Vox and <laughs> Um, So how, it's actually funny how I got into metal. I got into metal for my older brother and he mm. had discovered Slipknot and of course to any, at that time I was nine. He was, I think 11 or 12. So of course, so like an 11, 12 year old, like Slipknot's like the most extreme, crazy thing, greatest thing you'd ever hear. It's like the of circus, course. right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, well, it is, there's like 10 members in that band. Of course it's a circus. <laughs> so they're all wearing those masks. And <laughs> yeah, so of course to a kid, it's like, oh my God, what is this? And then of course I thought it was stupid. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. I hated just, it. Just because you really liked it. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, and, and he and he would play Wait and Bleed on repeat uh, over and over again. And I was like, turn that off. It's annoying. It's screaming. It's, it's not music. I was just one of those jerks. And, um, and then eventually I started liking it. And then I discovered uh, that's, again, when new Metal was taking over. Uh, so Corn, that was the other band I got into. And then from there, I went to the old classics like Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, um, you know, Megadeth, et cetera, et cetera, from there. And 
uh, eventually, at first I got into the more gothic, like the Nightwish, Lacuna Coil stuff. And then it was a friend, this is back, I think I, I had to have been 14 or 15 now at this point. And a friend of mine said, oh, have you heard about death or have you discovered death? I was like, no, what's that? And he sent me the human album. And oh, yeah. like, <laughs> I could not believe anybody could play that material. And then from there it was Deicide, Cannibal Corpse, Obituary, and then- oh. Just the Florida scene. Yep. Oh, that, I, I'm very, few, very grateful. I'm sorry? Sorry, there's a few things that popped up right there. Okay. Uh, you went, your brother showed off Slipknot. You thought it was weird. Eventually <laughs> you got into it. Uh, new metal. How much of this new music coming into your life came from your brother or was it from your circle of friends? The, the influence of metal in your life? My brother was uh, the very first. So he got me into the new metal, but also he first discovered some of the more classics like Maiden Priest uh -huh. from video games that he was playing. And then- Guitar yeah, Hero, like, is that it? Does that make sense? I'm sorry? Guitar Hero, is that, is that, does that make sense? It wasn't Guitar Hero, but yeah. Like one of those uh -huh. influential games back in like the early, this had to have been the early 2000s. Uh -huh. um, I know uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. I think they yeah. had a Maiden song. They had Number of the Beast. Um, I can't remember which games had the priest songs, but yeah, it was a lot of whatever. The video games my brother was playing at the time. Mm -hmm. That's how I discovered um, some of the more traditional metal bands. And his best friend at the time was also like, he would always discover new bands before anybody else in our little age group. So, um, but yeah, and then also Pantera. Um, my brother's a big Pantera fan. He got me into Pantera as well. And then, but the Gothic stuff, I discovered that on my own, just from reading metal magazines. I started I reading a, Revolver. And I had a question about that. How much was it sort of you trying to find your, your own identity in the genre um, with female fronted bands? Was this something that allured to you that you were like, oh, this oh, is interesting. This is going to be mine. My brother's not really going to like it because it's not his style it's my thing and then your friends sort of female friends i'm assuming got into it um it was mainly when uh like i mentioned i saw pictures of like lacuna coil like mm -hmm. i remember it was a interview with christina uh scabia on mm -hmm. revolver and you know i mean yeah of course she's a woman you know very talented singer but of course like she just seemed cool like whatever okay. i liked her answers in the interview you know she seemed really like um down to earth and uh, from there, and I like Lucuna Coyle's music after I discovered, um, after I read that interview. And then Nightwish, it's the same thing. I saw, um, you know, whatever, pictures of the band that promoted in the magazine. And I was like, cool, let's look this band up now. And I got there, this was back when CD stores were a thing. So I got, I think once, um, one of their CDs. And I liked the opera singing. I thought that was cool. I never would have expected that in metal. Um, and, and then I guess, I don't know if I was trying to carve out like my own identity in metal. Um, I mean, I know, like I introduced those bands to my brother and he respected them, you know, especially like he loved the singing, um, but he's a drummer. So he's very specific. He likes, you know, to this day, he likes bands with really good drumming. Um, so not saying those bands don't have good drummers, but of course my brother, like, you know, he's one of those, he became obsessed with Mike Portnoy when Dream Theater was mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, like one of those types. So, um, and what else? Um, but then, yeah, I guess like Extreme Metal, that was just the friends I was hanging out with. I think the Florida scene had a lot to do with that as well. Like listening to Death, Obituary, DSI, all it's like you're in the stomping grounds of where everything came from. It's like it's like Montreal yeah. now with, with <laughs> absolutely. tech debt. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's interesting to see the amount of bands that are continuing to evolve out of Florida and the ones that are going to continue evolving out of Montreal because we've seen it's possible to do it. Growing up mm -hmm. in, in, in jam rooms, knowing that songs were written in these walls, it gives you almost the sense of possibility that you can do it again. And there's actually a jam space, people storage in Tampa. And I've mm -hmm. been there mm -hmm. so many times. I've heard like, stories about it. Oh yeah, that's where Cannibal Corpse still mm -hmm. rehearses and a bunch, a bunch of bands. Uh, I've, in heard, the I've heard it's so, really fucking hot. Well, Florida's really fucking hot in general. So it's not like something 
you know, I mean, obviously if you have a big fan, like they're not air conditioned rooms, as long as you have a big fan, it's fine. But, uh, but yeah, I've been it's a people's good storage. suffering. Absolutely. <laughs> it is good suffering. I think all, all extreme metal is good suffering. As, as Lord Worm would say. Uh, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's definitely a Lord Worm sentence right there. Uh, let's dance into uh, shows, your first shows. Do you remember the first show that you went to go see? Speaking Doesn't of have to be metal. Not. Okay, perfect. Oh, it was. Yep, it was a subliminal versus tour. Really? So it was a uh, Slipknot, Lamb of God, Shadows Fall, and the Bled. So that was definitely very impressionable for a 12 year old. I can imagine. Did you go with your brother or did you go? Yep. Uh, my brother and our dad, and our dad was not very happy the entire <laughs> night. He had a newspaper, was reading the newspaper while no. I. Well, oh yeah, oh yeah. We were sitting up in the nosebleeds. And he's flipping through the newspaper while I'm headbanging. No way. Let's. Uh, I typically <laughs> ask what the soundtrack of your youth is, where what your parents listened to. What What was your dad into, if he wasn't uh, into <laughs> Slipknot and Lamb of uh, God? <laughs> uh, Led Zeppelin. Um, I actually inherited his whole vinyl collection, and wow. my dad was because, of course, I knew he loved Led Zeppelin. Um, he loved well he loved everything by eric clapton but he especially loved his work with cream he loved mm -hmm. the beatles um all you know jefferson airplane i knew he was a big janice joplin fan like all of the rock and folk artists from like the 60s to the 70s my dad was a big big fan of that uh of, of that style and then i got into that style but then when i inherited his vinyl collection i discovered like all these obscure folk bands that I would never have known before. And I had actually was talking to um, a friend of mine and he was just yapping away about some folk singer. I, I don't know. And I, but I recognize the folk singers. I can't remember what the singer is now, but I recognize his name. And I said, oh, I have some of his vinyl um, from my dad's collection. And then my friend was like trying to like sell me the vinyl. He's like, that stuff is rare. I'm like, my dad's collection. I am not selling no, it. No, no, no. Not selling it. Mm -mm. <laughs> nope. So apparently, I have some very, very expensive vinyl, like some probably some first pressings in there <laughs> for my dad's collection of all. Like, amazing. but of course, yeah, of course, he has like Led Zeppelin and um, you know all all the classics. Uh, what was it about metal that was too much for your dad? I think the I think the vocals. I think for mm -hmm. most people with uh, perspective, it's the vocals, which I love. I like the, the music. I like the music, but the singing's a bit too much. Yeah, I See, remember my I mom don't... saying that about Slipknot, the first album. This drummer's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I like the drummer. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, the uh, see, I've always loved metal vocals. I'm just not saying that because I'm you're talking to me. Like I've always just was so fascinated by growls and um, how you know, and also like how to sing with melody while you're mm -hmm. growling, and it just sounds so monstrous and inhuman. I love it. You you never attempted to to get on stage, and correct me if I'm wrong there. I actually was, um, because I mentioned people's storage because I was briefly in a band. I actually taught myself how to growl. Um, Amazing. Yep, uh, Street Weave. It's more it's like, so we took the Tampa, it was more of like a thrashy style. We kind of took the whole Tampa vibe, but made a big joke out of it. Like we had a song about hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, we had a bunch of silly songs, like another song about a flamingo, like a bunch of silly Tampa that kind of like poked fun at, um, at Tampa and the whole like vibe and culture of, you know, that part of Florida. Um, and it was actually my guitar player. He had a kid and I, and at that point I was also kind of, I was wanting to focus more on my writing. And uh -huh. I know the other, like the drummer in the band, he was in a bunch of bands as it was. And uh, so was the other guitar player. And we all just kind of like, you know, broke up so to say, but after the guitar player left, you know, when he had a kid, but um, it was fun. I learned that I, I prefer the process of making music and working with other musicians more than actually being on stage. Because I feel like it's just so much pressure. You have to get to the venue on time and they have to load it and da da da, sound check. It's like, I just want to just have fun <laughs> and drink a couple <laughs> beers, have people storage with my friends and make weird noises in a microphone. <laughs> is, is it something you still find yourself doing, screaming? Is it something yeah. you do in the shower? Or did you did you hang up your 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 
your screams in order to oh. pick up your writing. Well, let's see. Can I still do them? Yes, I can. I'm actually shocked. Okay, so <laughs> not not doing my screams for a long time. It actually sounded not terrible. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's pretty good. <laughs> nice. You're hired. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're hired. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know what I'm hired for, but I'm hired for something. <laughs> uh, you you. We're interviewing people for a long time. You, the Age of Metal and then Infernal TV was the yep. next time that we hooked up and you interviewed me in the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about being an interviewer, what that means to you. Uh, Infernal TV is more than that. It was like your website. You have like a, a movie thing, a book thing, some, something going on there as well. Um, talk to me about Infernal TV, please. All right. Um, so, well, I mean, I guess... At that point, uh, when I formed Infernal TV, I had been a music journalist for, I would wanna say five years at that point. And I mean, I did a bunch of amazing things with other websites, but um, very shortly after, um, you know, I started my um, venture as a music journalist, I wanted to form my own website, do my own thing. Um, because I had a lot of ideas for my, um, you know, like how I wanted my interviews to look, how I wanted to approach content creation and everything. And, um, and I was just interested in the editorial aspect of journalism. The, the beside, and, that's the behind the scenes, yep. the, the thinking before the questions are even asked. Oh, absolutely. Um, and yeah, so um, I ended up, because The Age of Metal, I've been with that website for years. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and, I, and the editor, uh, the guy who ran it, he actually moved to Europe. So I don't think the website's active anymore. Um, correct? I mean, I'll have to, I... It didn't appear to be yeah. as I was checking before I sat down here. Uh -huh. But I might, I might have not looked good enough. Yeah, I was... I know uh, Miguel, he's contributing to, I think I saw he's doing stuff with Metal Insider now. He's working for another website. Um, but yeah, I think after he moved overseas, he kind of hung up the, the website. Um, but I had left before that too. Um, we'll want to focus more on writing books. And um, while I was writing the first draft of Dissecting House, I formed Infernal TV. Um, and yeah, so like I said, I just kind of wanted to do my own thing uh, for my own website. And yeah, that's how Infern that's how I birthed Infernal TV. And um and yeah, I mean it is nice because I pretty much just get to do what I want. I get to cover the artists I want and um it's, and at that point I had, um, cause I worked full time as a freelance writer doing uh, search engine optimization and everything. So I applied that knowledge as well to, uh, to my websites and uh, really started to explore more about like, you know, like, like I said, the content creation process and uh, really using my own creativity towards my own content, you know, rather than listening to like an editor, another editor doing what they want. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, I still like, I uh, contribute to Outburn magazine. Um, mm -hmm. They treat me extremely well over there. Um, whenever I have like an idea, whatever, like my editors are always cool to like, if I pitch something, they're always cool to whatever, just let me run my own thing. And um, so, yeah, I love working with Outburn. I also work for a couple like a uh, guitar website, guitarspace.org and a rock website, rockerainsider.com. And again, like working with that, um, those editors is always really great. So I do stuff other than Infernal TV and music, but Infernal TV is like my little baby. Talk to me about uh, be becoming a music journalist. Mm -hmm. what, where does that come from? What, what, what was the mindset? What, what got you into that? I, I fell into it. I was like, I'm going to drink beer with my friends. <laughs> and, then, and then the publicist found me. And, and then I, I, I end up, you know, work. having a conversation with a new friend. And then, you know, 30, 40 minutes in, I finally talk about what the publicist wants me to talk about. But <laughs> respectfully, of course. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, but so I, like, well, I guess going back to when I was, um, you know, a teenager discovering 
my first metal bands and looking through a revolver and all those uh -huh. magazines. And at that point I, had, cause I had started writing just creative, you know, fiction, whatever. Um, young, I was like six years old. So I knew I always wanted to be a writer. Um, wow. And uh, when I was like, again, reading the interviews with revolver, I'm like, Hey, I could do this. So I got uh, my first magazine writing gig. I was 20. And it was for Tampa Bay's Mayhem magazine. I wish I was back uh, in Florida. I could actually show you. I still have some of those old magazines, but I don't bring them to Montreal when I come up here. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, um, so Tampa Bay's Mayhem magazine and they weren't like a metal magazine. They mainly covered local artists, but, you know, the editor was still able to hook me up with a couple of interviews with all these, you know, different bands and everything. Um, but I wanted to focus on something more specific to metal because I knew that's the genre I wanted to cover so then that's when I got with the age of metal I had also contributed to metal Wani as well doing uh -huh. like some reviews and everything and then um that all led again to um me forming my own website and then I had also been published uh, one time in metal hammer um but that's how I met Jeremy Saffer from Outburn Magazine, the editor-in-chief, and then he got me uh, into Outburn. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, how I just always loved magazines. I loved collecting, reading magazines. And um, when I, cause it was cool being with the first gig, uh, again, they were a print magazine, only print. Um, but then I saw the things were moving to the online space. So I kind of hopped on that. But then after a while, I missed like a physical magazine. So uh, Outburn's back in print now. So like it's all, I always get the, the different issues. And I love flipping through them. And it's like, yeah, it's a physical magazine again. It's like my I name right there on it. <laughs> vivid memories of my dad. I don't know how my dad got them. He, he would bring home these magazines and I would flip yeah. through them. But it's just such a feeling. My room yeah, was just like plastered with various faces as a teenager. <laughs> You, you just rip out the pictures you just the one that i wanted on exactly. yes <laughs> <laughs> it was the best so yeah. so so you've been writing stories since you're six years old mm -hmm. uh i read that your, your dad discovered at 10 years old that you could write well, what's that story <laughs> this is so embarrassing um i well i i also love wrestling as a kid oh yes who doesn't and... like wrestling well, I had a crush you live, on the wrestling. You live in Florida, too, because it's, you have no choice but to like death metal and wrestling. <laughs> True. Um, but I had a big crush on the wrestler Edge. <laughs> and I wrote a little fan fiction the day I met Edge. Because <laughs> I was so upset because WWE came to Tampa and my parents wouldn't let me go. And I cried oh. and I got mad. So I wrote a <laughs> story if I were to have gone to WWE and met the wrestler Edge and so my dad finds this document on the computer um and he actually created like a little book he found nice. all these pictures of Edge online and he like put together a little book and he gave it to me the like the day of, of the of the whatever the, the event the wwe event gave me the little book and that's how we discovered my that's writing <laughs> I, I hope the book was more pg than <laughs> oh, what you're writing now because now, now you've written you've written three books like yes and i i've read all three i've like literally like read them and destroyed one of them sadly <laughs> it, it, i read them for real so so people will know that I actually did read them. It started out with the, the Dissecting House, which is uh, a Mina Bassey serial killer novel. Uh, you've written two Mina Bassey's so far. Uh, what was your mindset? Now, I've, I've written a book of short stories. I did that back in 20, 2009. In 2009, it, it was not easy. So, so, and I'm not proud of them. So, so talk to me about this first book that mindset of I'm going to write a book, I'm actually going to do it. Uh, do you remember that day, the first time you sat down, where, where the ideas came from? I'd love to hear about the, the birth story, which is a question I hate to ask musicians typically, but I'm interested. 
So, well, actually, my very first book technically wasn't even Dissecting House. Um, I wrote, uh, it's more of a dark fantasy um, book when I was in high school. And I didn't publish it, obviously. Well, I've lost all those files. Again, that was about 15, 10, 15 years ago. Um, but, um, but that was technically the first book I wrote. And, but going, and so going into Dissecting House, I had already learned um about like whatever the novel writing process um from falling out of the frost so that was the first book that i wrote and getting organized and um because at first i just you know i, I would wing it but mm -hmm. now i've learned you have to plan you have to write different notes that's actually something i got from jk rowling she said that in an interview she had uh, index cards for all of her different characters and everything. So uh, you have to plan everything. You have to plan the chapters, you have to plan the characters, you know, even if it's just like a sentence, like this is who the character is, this is what they look like, this is their personality, whatever. Um, just something so you can refer back and keep yourself organized while you're writing. Um, so I already, um, I already knew, you know, prepared myself for that when I wrote Dissecting House. Um, but that particular book, I actually had that idea when I was in college, but, you know, full-time student, I worked also, and I was still interviewing bands, so I didn't have time to write a book. Um, but it was just gnawing at my brain for years, just this, I, and it's like, it's more all these different scenes of Mina, like that, that end scene that everybody, that, that freaks everybody out. Uh, that was one of the scenes that was in my mind. And also a couple scenes that I ended up uh, using for my, for the sec, for the sequel. Those were in my mind while I was in college. And um, I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, obviously, yes, it is more of a feminist horror. It's a female serial killer who targets men, but, um, I didn't really uh, have that, I like, I didn't really approach it with that idea when I first started writing it. It was just like, oh, it'd be cool to have a female killer murder men, <laughs> a book about that. And because I mean, you know, again, it's not the first book where there's a female, like where the woman is the perpetrator and the men are the victims. Like you can look at Audition. Uh, that's a good example. Mm -hmm. um, a movie and a book, and I just read the book. Also, it's phenomenal. Um, and then there's another book, Heartsick, uh, where there's a female killer. Um, but I guess I just wanted, especially with um, now, I wrote that book before Me Too. But um, still, just some, I guess, like some of my experiences as a woman, you know, getting harassed and yada yada. Um, I wanted to incorporate that in there. And then at that time I had in college, I think that was pivotal in a way because I did take a couple of feminist theory classes, but I also took um, um, women writer courses as well. And one of them it, uh, classes that I took was uh, women writers in the 19th century. And um, I learned a lot of, you know, not only about, you know, like, you know, some of the, more um, iconic, you know, female writers from that era, but also of, you know, the culture, the society uh, from the 19th century. And one of them was the angel in the house. Um, that's what they, the, the standard of women during that time where you had to be like ideally blonde, pretty, or, you know, whatever, serve, you know, serve the kids, serve the husbands. And, you know, you wear these tight corsets and you can't breathe and, you know, all the, it's, ridiculous but Mina kind of like she's blonde hair blue eyed beautiful woman but a, she's a totally antithesis like her personality but looks wise that is what she looks like so there are some aspects um about feminism that definitely influenced the dissecting house but I think I kind of grew more into uh the feminist ideals like specifically with some of the men she targeted and how mm -hmm. they treated her and then how she kind of uh got back at them so there, there's, I wrote you <laughs> early on <laughs> as I was reading Dissecting House. And then as I was writing it, I was like, would I write this to a male friend? And then I was like, yeah, I would. So so I, I had mentioned that I, I think I should be nicer to you the next time I see you, because it, it's quite You've graphic. You've always been nice to me. <laughs> You've always been nice to me, though. It, it, it's quite, quite graphic. It's, it's, you know, we come from a world of death metal, so we're used to gore, we're used to 
pushing the boundaries when it comes to our imagination uh, in the gruesomeness of things, but um, it's out there. It's it's some of the gruesomest, gruesomest stuff that I've read, and I don't know if it's because it's tied into to uh, the severing of male organs or or the storage of them and the the lack of care of them afterwards. Uh, where did the the gruesomeness come from that that you've put into your work? Uh, the gruesomeness gruesomeness came from my love of horror. Um, that's how that's how uh, the ex the extremities came from. Um, around that time, I also discovered um, extreme horror films because, of course, at that point, I had watched whatever all of like Friday the Thirteenth and Halloween. I've seen all of them all. Um, but there is the sub the subgenre of the extreme horror films that just freaking they break you. <laughs> like I remember the first time I watched Salo, that movie broke me. Um, yeah, and that movie absolutely. If you've never seen that movie, proceed with caution. <laughs> That's all. I'm best. That movie broke me. Um, and then Cannibal Holocaust. Those, I mean, it was just more like the because I love animals and they ate a turtle mm -hmm. in the movie, and that kind of made me bummed out but um yeah that one martyrs um that's another good one like serbian film mm -hmm. all that like that genre of extreme horror films um i had discovered that around the time of writing dissecting house and so i think that you know spawned like a oh i want to take that but with books but as I find out a couple of years later, there's a whole other uh, literary genre of extreme <laughs> horror books that go there even further. So, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, I, I I know I freak Rob out, like I would say 90% of the time when I talk about the books that I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me, me is a very captivating, main character to the point where I, you sent me all three books. I know that you wrote The Howling of the Dead between the two, but I immediately jumped to Screaming Streets because uh, she was such a captivating character. I wanted to know what the hell was going to go on and what was going to happen with her. And uh, it's interesting to, to have a, it's like you made the decision that Mina Bassi was going to be something you were going to continue writing. Mm -hmm. When, when you started the first book. Yep, and I knew there was going to be three. Mm, okay, interesting. Well, the third will be a prequel. I'm, I'm writing that right now, actually. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Let, let's jump to the middle one, though, the, the Howling of the Dead. Yep. Uh, you, you've, you mentioned to me in, in writing as we we're setting this up that uh, some of this is based on true stories. So, so what, 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 how, how much, you have it in the beginning that, uh, all of this is fiction, the typical <laughs> that, that authors put in names and such are, are not real. Uh, but these guys are actually metalheads. Uh, they're in a band together, a couple uh, move into a house. The house is fucked up. They have a great experience. Uh, how much of, of your writing is based on your life is actually inspired? You mentioned that some of the Mina stuff was inspired uh, from shitty things that you went through so so to talk to me about the the influence the inspiration that that goes into your writing well uh for the howling of the dead um i mean there's one scene and, and there are no spoilers here but it's the couple kylie and brayden they're outside they're i don't i'm smoking weed or smoking cigarettes i don't remember what they're doing um but they hear this terrifying scream but it's more of like an animalistic scream that kind of sounds almost like it's in another dimension. It's like almost digital sounding, um, mm. staticky. I actually went through that. That happened. It was me and not Rob, but the guy, um, my ex-boyfriend, uh, but he and I were together at the time. And he lived out in not like the woods, but he lived in a small town in South Carolina. So uh, there was still a lot of like woods, um, you know, I don't know how many acres uh, of land was on his house, but, you know, he had a decent sized property and, um, you know, woods surrounding us, everything. So uh, he and I were out, you know, we're just smoking weed, just talking, whatever, in his backyard. And then we hear that scream. That's exact, that exact scream that I described in the book. 
and I was like I'm freaking out like just chills all over my body and I was like what was that he's like oh yeah I hear that da, 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 whatever whatever and he's like all just being so nonchalant about everything and then he's like oh yeah there are Native American burial grounds on this property and at first I just thought he was scaring me but then the next day I actually spoke to his dad about it and his dad's like no there really is Native American burial grounds out here I'm like oh, book idea book idea so, <laughs> and that um because I wrote that book after we broke up, like right after we broke up. Um, and it was just like all the idea was so threat, it was so fresh, like a couple and um, they're, they're, they're together in the book, but they're kind of, you know, not really like doing too well, but they're hoping going to, to this cabin will kind of help to whatever, get their lives back in order. He can pursue his music. She can por- pursue her horse breeding business and, um, yeah and, and the whole thing goes to shit <laughs> and like other than oh and then there's another scene where they're sleeping and then you hear the footsteps but they sound like hooves uh-huh. and again that happened to me and my ex we were you know well we had just both gone to bed and um there was the porch that was right outside of his bedroom and again i thought i heard what sounded like footsteps so i shake him i'm like oh my god there's footsteps there's footsteps and i'm like pointing to the door he's like those are just acorns go to bed which so is the next exactly day, what happened in the book, yeah. Yeah, and so, well, the next day, there were acorns all over, the, <laughs> uh, all, all, all over, so it's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, he's right, but Amazing. of course, in the book, there are no acorns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was scary, it was fun, it was, uh, I love the metal aspect, the, the descriptive uh, nature of him, the way he plays. Uh, you can tell, you know, you're a metalhead, so obviously, it comes across that way but it's it's refreshing to read stuff written by metalhead and not something that's just you know invented and contrived by someone that has no idea what's going on just because it fits the character there's a few things also in 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 the in the screaming streets as well there was the the two metalheads that nina runs into (laughs) near the end which was it was very and you know they're having this debate about a band or something and it was it's interesting to read that So how I approach that scene is, you know, when we talk about these bands, we just, because we're so passionate about it, we (laughs) love these bands, and we get so into it. And I always wonder, like, God, to the outside world, we probably sound like freaking idiots. Yes. (laughs) So I just kind of wanted to create two guys who were just talking about some, like, doom death band like no this is their best this is their best album and then mina and her slave are in the car like what the fuck are they talking about (laughs) (laughs) it was fun it was fun Uh, i'd like to talk about the evolution of your writing uh i have to say that um the latest one screaming straits is by far your best writing i feel like i feel like the writing has really just stepped up i don't know what you had to do to get there I'm interested in that. Uh, there, there is Lindsay Smith that stepped in as as an editor, as, as someone that reads mm-hmm. your your work now, because it's very hard to to edit and read your own stuff. It's absolutely we, yeah. we don't see what's actually written is is the problem. Absolutely, and um, oh oh yeah, and 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 she was great um, as far as an editor. But I mean, I think it's beyond like it's hard to answer that question as far as you mentioned Screaming Streets. To this day, I'm not fully satisfied with that book. Like the first time, well, I mean, again, I'm no spoilers, um, but like, as you know, uh, you know, Mina changes, her situation changes in the second book. And I knew she would have to be a lot more vulnerable, but I feel like when I first wrote it, I made her too vulnerable and I lost her character. Mm. And when I was going back through, because I do, so like now I have an editor, but I do also edit myself Mm -hmm. um, as well. And before I always do my own, I do like, I think three rounds of edits before even giving it to the editor. Uh, Yeah. So, um, and I remember going through my first round of edits and I'm like, this isn't Mina. This is Amina. You lost and, the post-it. The post-it fell yep. off the board. <laughs> yep. So then I had to read, even right before I published it, even after the editor had it, I still was reading sections like, Mm-mm, I don't like this. And I re- rewrote like half of a chapter. Um, so maybe, maybe that is, you know, you're not the first person who said it. Another um, 
another one of my readers told me that he thought the sequel was better than the first book. And again, that shocked me just because I put it out there, like still not 100% about it, but knowing I already said I would release a book on this day, I'm going to freaking release it. So, because mm. I knew if I would keep going back, the book will never come out. So I just forced it out there and still wasn't 100% about it. But maybe the fact that I did just, you know, I was super critical about my work and kept going back and revising and, um, you know, or maybe I just had a better grasp of who Mina was. Uh, maybe that also had a lot to do with it. Um, I don't know, but I did learn a lot um, because I wrote Dissecting House not knowing any, like I knew how to write, but I didn't know anything about the publishing world. Uh -huh. And um, and I didn't know anything like, I mean, obviously I had read like whatever, Stephen King, Clive Barker, like the big horror writers, but there was another subgenre of extreme uh -huh. horror I had not even touched and splatterpunk I never even knew existed. So I wrote uh, Screaming Streets after reading some, you know, like other notable writers. Um, and other books and that the more extreme genre. So maybe that also had a lot to do with it. Um, again, I'm, I don't know, but I also know I had, um, I mean, of course, like you mentioned an editor, but it's actually some of my beta readers, some of my colleagues who were the most, like the biggest help and, you know, said, don't use adverbs in your writing. Don't, um, uh, what, what is another good piece of advice? I know the adverb one, um, I can't think right now, but like they ended up giving me some, you know, very, very good critiques that, um, oh, uh, repetition, uh, don't, you know, try to be aware of repetition. And so I use those critiques, I, you know, towards my other books now with my next two books now. So, yeah. Good stuff. Keep it going. And, and absolutely, I think that giving yourself a deadline, pushing yourself to get there, being hypocritical, yeah. it's only going to make the work better. And, and absolutely. The big master writer Stephen King he plops at books and plops is the wrong word he releases books uh very frequently so I can only imagine that he probably doesn't like each one as much as he probably should either and, and yeah that I know for a fact um independent release mm -hmm. talk to me about that decision versus getting it published you tried to find a publisher um the record label versus the independent band well, yes um, I first, well, I had actually sat on Dissecting House for about a year before I published it, mm. uh, self-published, because I was trying to get, a pu at first I contacted publishers, and then agents, and then even indie horror publishers, and nobody would sign me. I just kept getting ghosted, like, no responses, not even a rejection. So, eventually I just said, fuck it, I'm self-publishing, um, I did a bunch of research on publishing on Amazon and it's so easy. It mm -hmm. is so easy. Mm -hmm. And even talking to some of my musician friends and colleagues um, who, you know, they might have a couple of bands, like one might be signed to a label, but their other project, you know, it might be like a band camp type of deal. And they actually told me the same thing. It is so easy to self-publish music. And you know, I even was, um, again, obviously no names mentioned, but I was talking to one, you know, pretty notable musician who, you know, he told me that he thinks for the next like 10 years, 10, 15 years, there won't even be a need for a label. And I think the same thing for, um, uh, and for writing. And we are going into that, uh, that direction now because a lot of writers that I know, most of them are, if they're not full self-published, they still do self-publish their own work. Or if they do have a publisher, it's just an indie publisher. They don't have like a big, big name publisher. Because even if you get with an indie publisher, or even if you have the right connect, like distribution connections as a, a self-published author, you can still get your books in the bookstores. Mm -hmm. But even, um, I actually did talk to one of my uh, author colleagues, and he told me to this day, he still gets his best sales on Amazon. To this day, it's, and, and you can publish your own work on Amazon. It's so easy. So it's like, you know, we're already going in that direction. But I mean, of course, there are, as I'm sure there are benefits of getting a label, there are benefits of having a publisher, you know, for promotion, um, marketing. Um, you know, there's a lot of 
investments into publishing your own writing. You know, you have to get an editor, a uh, book cover, all of that, but you don't have to worry about that when you have a publisher. So of course there are benefits, but. But you found a niche, you, you, you've you mm -hmm. hit, there's people that are interested in what you're writing and that's what's important. Absolutely. So, so that's just gonna keep growing. I'm a fan. I'm excited with what you've built. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I saw you were doing it, I had to do it. Uh, you sent me these three books. I read them. I literally brought them with me to work on the metro, the subway. Broke this one. Uh, you signed them. And I'm going to sign them. And then we're going to do like a, a giveaway where I'm going to ship these three books to a Vox and Hop says, uh, you got to pay attention in the next few days when you're listening to this episode. There'll be a post about it. I'll do a collaborative post with uh, Stephanie here uh, on Instagram, probably, and you could you could win these books, and I'll ship them to you. And it's the actual books that I read. So, uh, cheers to Stephanie for for sending them to me, so that I can enjoy them before this conversation. It was important for me to know what the hell I'm talking about because that, that's what I like to do. Um, if Mina, and I don't think she would like beer, she doesn't seem to be a character that would enjoy a beer. She doesn't like to lose control. Uh, she likes to be in control. So, if she could make a beer. What style of beer would it be and what would we call it? Uh, you know, I drank, I had a beer. I think it, the brewery, it was a small brewery in St. Pete. It's called If I Ruled the World. And it was a stout, but it was blood red in color. <laughs> that would be the beer because, <laughs> well, I mean, beyond the fact that it's brutal looking, like the blood red beer, but Mina is the type of person you look at her Mm -hmm. but you wouldn't expect her to be a sadistic serial killer mm -hmm. so um so a beer like that uh or one of those like um it's um the pale ales but they're actual stouts uh master of disguise from stone brewing that's a good example something like that i feel like those because those just perfectly describe who mina is like just completely unexpected <laughs> Love that. Uh, one last question, classic Vox and Hops wrap up question. Um, it probably doesn't happen to you very often because you're very busy uh, writing all the time. You're, you're creating new things. You're here in Montreal, you're back in Florida, but every once in a while it happens to everyone. What is your hangover cure? Oh, I definitely have <laughs> hangovers. Um, I mean, so I, I'll, I'll try not to be too wordy about this, but I suffer from migraines. Mm. um but I last year I mean I've been experimenting with my diet but I've noticed that the plant-based diet has been the best for my body and I've experienced a significant reduction in migraines like now I don't even get hangovers anymore so I don't know if it's just like the fact I'm consuming more nutrients or uh, maybe you know the animal products is causing inflammation in my body like I haven't really talked to my doctor about this so I'm not a medical professional I'm not going to tell you what exactly um, you know what caused that but I mean I guess just uh, nutrition that's just to me the best hangover cure um, Obviously, this is not very nutritious, but taking a couple Advil before bed, that always helps. Uh, drinking water. Um, yeah. Um. <laughs> Great advice. Um, I love it. I'm a vegan. I don't talk about it very often on the podcast, but uh, I am, and uh, I do still suffer from hangovers, though. Oh, um, <laughs> Oh no. Okay. So I might debunk that one. Uh, oh. Stephanie, thank you so, so much for hanging out with me, talking about your life, music, craft, beer. Everyone, go pick up these books. If you like really, really scary, very extremely gruesome uh, <laughs> stories that will make you think about not going down the alley or most definitely not picking up that girl in the bar when she's too <laughs> eager to come home with you, uh, if you're a bad person. <laughs> pick them up and enjoy them. Uh, Stephanie, thank you so much. This is amazing. I greatly, greatly appreciate you taking the time. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. So I have a little bit of a beer left. <laughs> hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right there. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, this was awesome. I love, love hanging out with different types of people. And an author is someone that I've only done a few times, as I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, uh, I think only a handful of times. I love it. I think it's just so cool to connect with metal artists that do different things. And Stephanie is definitely doing that. 
with her very, very vulgar, extreme, gory, strange horror novels that she's writing. I'm a fan, and I'm looking forward to the next installment uh, so that uh, she can shock me some more. Uh, Massive cheers to Stephanie. Thank you so, so much for hanging out with me. I had an absolute blast, and I hope that you did as well. Now, if you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a month that contains all of the details of everything that has happened recently in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. You'll get to see which episodes I've released recently. You'll get to see which episodes I have coming up. You'll get to see which albums the Vox and Hops album review crew have reviewed recently. You'll get to see any information about any projects I have in the works before I announce them to the public. And trust me, I always have a bunch of things going on behind the scenes. You also get to see which albums Jerry Monk, the metal architect himself, has added to the Brutal Awakenings playlist. The most extreme, fresh, new music that is dropping every week. Jerry listens to it all somehow and he puts it on the playlist for you to enjoy. It's available on both Apple Music and Spotify. The Brutal Awakenings playlist is what you want to be listening to. Trust me, there's just so much going on in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. I hate for you to miss a single thing, so sign up to the mailing list. The Vox and Hops Metal Podcast is brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcasts. I hope you have a killer weekend. I will be back next week with two episodes yet again, one on Tuesday and another on Friday. But until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops hits. Oh,